Okay, so good evening. Uh, so uh, uh, last Tuesday we discussed. Sorry, Monday, sorry, last Monday. Last Monday we discussed about the uh, fuel system. So today uh, we plan to continue the discussion. So uh, as uh, if you can remember what we discussed, uh, uh, we have already covered the requirement of a fuel system, types of fuels, and characteristics of them. Well, petrol fuel system and the diesel fuel system. So we basically, during the previous class, uh, we basically covered all of these and uh, in, in the petrol fuel system and diesel fuel system, we actually went through it, almost everything except for this electronic fully controlled fuel system. So uh, I actually promised you that I will be discussing this one today. Uh, since we are going to discuss this today, I also have to make a small correction here. Now, we are going to discuss about the electronic fuel injection system, right? Uh, but this fuel injection system, uh, when it comes to uh, gasoline or petrol engine, this is directly related to or directly uh, connected with the ignition system. So, we'll go ahead and we'll discuss the uh, fuel system. I will discuss the fuel system, but uh, once we completed the ignition system, we will be discussing the, about this one again, uh, just to have a little bit more idea on this. Okay, so uh, if you can remember in the last uh, discussion, I explained to you what is the uh, what's the problem with the uh, fuel systems that we used to have earlier. That means. Uh, uh, what we call these uh, carbureted fuel systems and uh, normal diesel mechanical diesel fuel injection systems. So these sort of fuel systems actually comes under these early fuel systems, which are actually our open loop system, open loop control system. So these fuel has to be controlled. So how we as the driver, what we do is we actually control the vehicle by controlling the fuel. Right, the amount of fuel going into the engine. So in order to do that, we use a control system. So the control system we utilized earlier, or the ones we uh, actually uh, used earlier, are uh, comes uh, are uh, called as open loop system. So we give our input and the process uh, to a controller that the control system change do some process, and we receive some output. Output being the power increase. Right, power increase or the combustion. So, uh, process is actually delivering more fuel. Right. So, in this regard, the problem here is we have no idea what is happening inside the combustion chamber. We never measure it. So, if we put, uh, let's say, 10, uh, not 10, usually around 5 uh, cubic centimeters of petrol into the combustion chamber. Uh, we never measure or we never considered or we never bothered to know whether that five uh, five cc so five cubic centimeters were actually combusted or most of is it coming out or not so that means it's not an effective system so the problem with this system we found uh, we means people found the problems with these systems in early 50s because of the Emission is so after the emissions to the issues started. This uh, uh, this problem was actually found out later. In order to fix that, uh, the uh, closed loop system was implemented. So closed loop implemented uh, closed loop system means the output will be actually measured again. Right, uh, that measured output will be fed back into a controller or into uh, into the system in order to actually do fine adjustments to the process to get a better output right so the previous ones as i told you earlier they are very inefficient and need constant uh, constant adjustments or constant maintenance for example, if we go with the carburetor fuel injection, carburetor system, 
you need to actually tune the whole system. You know, you might have heard this. There's a term called tune up, right? The term called the term known as tune up actually came from uh, this. Uh, older vehicles like 1970s, 80s, those were actually 70s and uh, early 80s. Those vehicles actually had tune-up. Nowadays, we don't need actually tune-up. There's no point of actually doing any tune-up because we, we, we do not actually change anything. The tune-up tune means we basically change a lot of things in the, uh, we change clearances, we change a small, uh, like in the petrol engine, we can actually change the jet sizes. And we can actually in the fully uh, ignition system also we can actually change the gap, the uh, electrode gap, and measure those things. That process, right? That is what actually known as tuner, right? That is the start of the tuner. At the moment, right? Nowadays, tuner be just a cleanup, right? The correct word for that is cleanup. There's nothing to be adjusted except for few things in like now. Uh, that's also like few years back now, uh, like after 2000, there's an almost nothing to be uh, fiddled with. We can't do any adjustments. Everything will be adjusted by the vehicle itself. So we will be moving up to that point from starting from that. Uh, so we have already discussed about the carburetor system. So now what we're going to do is we are going to little by little discuss up to uh, uh, this uh, modern uh, very uh, very much complex and computer controlled fuel system so coming back to this uh, electronically controlled fuel system so uh, closed loop fuel system uh, if we consider this uh, closed loop fuel system since you all might have already learned about these automobiles and i know most of you have heard about heard and learned a lot into this electronic fuel system so, uh, or EFI system. So uh, let me just give you a brief introduction here. So uh, here, the controller and process. So if we consider the electronic uh, EFI system for a petrol engine, the controller is basically the, our uh, electronic control module, right? Electronic control module. And the control signal is the, how it actually controls the fuel. So process is the injection of fuel, right? To for the combustion process, right? For the combustion process. Then that output, the exhaust, will be measured from a special sensor known as lambda sensor or oxygen sensor. That value will be sent back to the controller in order to consider whether what uh, it has been done doing all for what it has been doing what it was doing for the few uh, previously was whether it's correct or not right so whatever the amount of fuel uh, it actually put into the engine if it is okay or not if it is not okay then the controller will uh, change its control signal and reduce the fuel right in case if it's a rich if it feels like the combustion is uh, uh, if assume that the combustion had rich mix earlier so that means the controller will be uh, providing a send, uh, it will be sending a control signal next time uh, saying that process, uh, yeah, pro, uh, sending a control signal to the process to reduce the fuel, right? Reduce the fuel. So, uh, but this system could not be actually integrated into the, or oh, it could not be fully integrated into a. A uh, carburetor system, though it was tried earlier, I told you, electronically controlled carburetor, but still, it was uh, difficult to uh, obtain those uh, very fine adjustments in those uh, that particular type of engine. And I promised you guys to show you um, a carburetor. So, um, sorry, electronically carburetor, uh, electronically controlled carburetor. Uh, control module. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to find it, but I'll try to show it by next week somehow. Uh, it's okay. Um, but uh, let, let me try. Let me try by next week. Probably it's somewhere at home. I just need to search a little bit hard. So, uh, since this uh, mechanically or carbureted system could not be controlled very well up 
to our standard or the, up to the standards needed for the emission systems, then it has to be actually the engine has to be uh, uh, equipped with the electronic fuel injection system, right? Electronic fuel injection system. So before we go into the electronic fuel injection system, let us go back to the carbureted fuel system. So this image actually shows the carbureted fuel system, right? If we consider about the carbureted fuel system, so what, even if we are using a, a completely a different method to deliver the fuel into the engine, still we can utilize the same uh, signals and same in inputs that we have already uh, used for the carbureted system, right? So if we consider it, uh, consider what we uh, take inputs as for the uh, for this carbureted fuel system, we start with the throttle pedal, right? So our accelerator pedal is directly connected to the throttle pedal, right? Throttle pedal. So throttle valve. When we actually uh, move the throttle valve, it's uh, it changes the vacuum inside the combustion inside the manifold, right? So that vacuum, uh, manifold vacuum, right? That manifold vacuum. Oh, one one second, right? Someone is calling. Right, uh, come back. Yes, so by changing the throttle valve, that means when we change our, uh, when we press our accelerator pedal, it will not, it will actually move the throttle valve. When throttle valve is actually moving, the vacuum, right, vacuum inside this intake manifold actually change. Based on that vacuum, the amount of fuel goes into the, actually the amount of fuel sucked into the, combustion chamber actually depends on this intake uh, mani intake manifolds vacuum, right? So that's how the basically it works. But in case when we are actually starting in the morning, so in we are when we are starting in the morning, in order to make the starting easier, we need to add a little bit more fuel into there, right? A little bit more fuel into there. So in order to do that, we can't just use this throttle valve. So to fix that, we uh, we have used another valve, which is known as the um, choke valve, right? Choke valve to have a bridge means, right? With that, when the choke valve is closed, we have even more vacuum. So we can add, uh, we can actually take even more fuel into this combustion chamber. So we have a rich mixer. So that's also fixed. Now, afterwards, we had another issue when we are accelerating, suddenly acceleration. If you suddenly accelerate, the throttle valve will suddenly open, right? Suddenly open, then the fuel, right? This fuel suction will be interrupted, right? Will be interrupted. But sudden acceleration means we should not actually have any interruption. We need more 
power at that time so we need more fuel suddenly but it works other way around when throttle valve is suddenly open intake manifold vacuum drops right and when intake manifold vacuum drops so the amount of fuel goes inside actually it reduces to fix that a separate component called acceleration pump was actually fixed in right so this is how we actually fix the uh, normal or uh, this is how we actually manage with the uh, carburetor fuel system so for uh, using this electronic fuel system also we still can use all of these uh, all of these processes but we just have to little bit modify it to work with the electronic system so uh, instead of using the previous method right instead of using the previous method to uh, consume or suction the fuel based on the intake vacuum what we uh, what electronic fuel system utilizes it uses a electronic control module right electronic control module right uh, to actually meter the fuel in the carburetor you have a metering rod right small rod called as metering rod in order to control the amount of fuel goes inside and you have jets but in the uh, but in the electronic fuel injection system you don't have any of these things you have a small computer right very small computer which can actually which actually uh, consider all of the all the inputs that considered in the previous engines or the previous uh, type of engines but uh, utilize a set of actuators to control the fuel based on the inputs so inputs are actually the engine load which we actually taken from the throttle valve previously and the amount of air coming into the engine so in order to inject the fuel exactly as necessary to maintain the uh, stoichiometric air to fuel ratio we need to know how much of air going inside so we have air and engine rpm why we need engine rpm right why we need engine rpm so engine rpm is actually needed right engine rpm is exactly needed in order to uh, inject the fuel a uh, correct time in order for fuel to uh, mix and go inside because when the rpm increases the amount of time for air fuel mixture to uh, uh, properly mix and combust actually reduces so we need the engine rpm now because in the fuel injector you do not actually mix air fuel in the carburetor or inside the manifold you just inject the fuel into the uh, intake port right intake port so we need a little bit of more time then we have each piston location because if we have four cylinders we need to know which cylinder is going to be fired right next we need to know which uh, valve is now operating so intake or out uh, intake or exhaust so in order to find these things we need to have input so these are the inputs we have to consider so for each input we need to add a sensor right so in addition to that in order to fix this uh, uh, what we call the uh, closed loop circuit we have to consider the exhaust gas so exhaust gas is actually measured by the amount of oxygen present in the exhaust gas right by the uh, amount of oxygen present in the exhaust gas so a special sensor module was developed right a special sensor module was developed it generate electric current based on the amount of air oxygen present in the exhaust gas right so that uh, signal or that voltage actually goes back to the computer right goes back to the computer right it also interferes with the inputs so you have the inputs and you have this one as the feedback signal so that feedback signal is also considered before implementing the fuel injection time right 
So that's what actually shown in these two images. So first one is the previous one, but uh, lower image actually gives you the proper value, proper names and everything. So feedback circuit is actually shown in the ECU fuel metering actuator. So fuel metering actuator is the fuel injector in this case, right? So how does it work? So we know what are the inputs we need to take, what are the outputs we, uh, we are having and uh, what are the feedback. So engine load, to measure the engine load, we consider a throttle positioning sensor, right? So throttle positioning sensor gives, uh, uh, gives the engine an idea how much of power we actually request. V means the driver. So engine load means how much of uh, power we request from the vehicle. So amount of air coming into the cylinder, we have something called air flow sensor, right? Next, we have engine RPM. So in order to get the engine RPM, we use the crank sensor. Each piston location, that's also we taken from the crank sensor. Well, opening and closing. Actually, closing, we don't need opening only, right? That we can actually measure from a cam sensor, okay? Then feedback signal. So feedback signal, we can consider it from the lambda sensor, also known as the quality of the combustion. Feedback signal is the quality of the combustion. If the uh, if the combustion was done properly, so it's like uh, if you can remember the equation, then we have very less uh, amount of oxygen present. So that's why it's called as the quality of the combustion. So high quality uh, combustion means less oxygen present in the uh, exhaust gas. Next, we measure the output. So, uh, sorry, not measure. The controlled output will be the amount of fuel delivered. So, in order to control the fuel output, we use the fuel injector, right? We use the fuel injector. Fuel injector is a electronically controlled solenoid valve which can be open and closed based on the uh, calculated time or calculated time durations by the electronic control module. So let us just try to fix everything into a one circuit, right? One circuit. So if you can remember, so uh, the previously we started with the fuel tank. So in this case also, we have the same scenario, right? Same scenario. So we have a fuel tank, right? Okay, before we go into the fuel tank, if you look at here, right, if you look at here, uh, there's one mistake here. So throttle valve, this should be actually throttle position sensor, not cam position sensor. Okay, so if you can remember the inputs, first we'll check the input. So the inputs were throttle position sensor. So we have throttle valve and throttle position sensor. And we need the airflow. This is the airflow from the air intake. We measure airflow goes to the ECU. Right. Next, we have the crank positioning sensor. So, crank positioning sensor measures two things: the location of the piston and the RPM of the engine. So that goes also to the ECU. Next, we have the cam positioning sensor. That's actually shown. Uh, it's also uh, similar to the crank positioning sensor. That also goes this way. So that's also input. So if you look at this clearly, you can see all the uh, inputs are actually marked in blue color, right? All the inputs are marked with blue color. Then we will go back to the uh, our feedback. So this is the cylinder, right? This is the cylinder. That means the engine. Let's assume, so this is actually essentially, this is essentially a single cylinder engine mode, right? This is essentially a single cylinder engine mode. So single cylinder engine mode, since we are talking about it. So exhaust is actually coming out from the cylinder from the valves. Then that exhaust will be actually measured by a separate signal, separate sensor known as oxygen sensor, right? Oxygen sensor signal, which is the feedback sensor, feedback signal that also comes back to the ECU. So here you can see it's mentioned, uh, it's shown in yellow color, right? It's shown in yellow color. So now we have inputs and feedbacks comes back to the ECU. Okay. 
inputs and feedbacks comes to the ecu next we have uh, our output output being the fuel injection timing so in order to do that we have to control the fuel injector so we have fuel injector here right fuel injector here so the red color arrows actually shows the output from the ecu right output from the ecu up to here i think all of you guys are clear if you have any questions you can actually put them in the uh, chat box so i can check and answer while we are going through so now we have the fuel injector now we have all the inputs and feedbacks and outputs now there's a small issue we didn't discuss about the fuel so uh, there's a small difference there's a small difference the main difference is the pressure the pressure this whole system actually operating at the previously if you can remember the normal carburetor fuel injection system fuel system it's not actually operating at a higher pressure but in the electronic fuel injection system it's actually operating at around around 2 to 4 bar something like that right but when we go even further in the this uh, lecture we will even discuss uh, fuel system go which goes even higher so we have fuel tank here from the fuel tank we have high pressure fuel tank so these brown or like orange color lines actually represents the part of fuel right represents the part of fuel so fuel tank from the fuel tank so it's a high pressure fuel pump sucks and pump fuel through a fuel filter into a pressure regulator now this is an important part right this is an important part in most of the um, previous like early generation and up to like very recently most of the fuel regulators used in the uh, use in the uh, car electronic fuel injection systems for especially for electron petrol fuel injection systems were mechanical right so this is go this uh, unit actually goes back to our good old days and carburetor system because this pressure regulates uh, sends the engine vacuum right sends the engine vacuum that's why there's a dash black line coming here that's actually uh, sends the pressure uh, vacuum right air sends the yeah sends the um, sorry sends the vacuum signal from the intake manifold right then measure right then not actually measure then control how much of fuel right how much of fuel pressure has to be maintained so this unit is uh maintaining the fuel pressure at a constant level all times in order to send fuel to the injector so fuel injector can exactly measure how much of fuel has to be uh, uh egg fuel injector can exactly meter the amount of fuel to be injected into the fuel uh sorry into the uh, cylinder right so hopefully you all understand it let me just give you how we how can be uh, let me explain it again from the beginning so we we'll, i'll start from the beginning beginning means from where we turn on the key right as soon as we turn on the key power goes to two places in this particular uh, vehicle so once the engine uh, key comes to the on position power comes to ecu as well as high pressure fuel pump right high pressure fuel pump so as long as this uh, fuel pump as long as the power is there the fuel pressure pump is high pressure fuel pump is actually working so it uh, turn on and it pressurize the whole system within matter of seconds right it pressurizes the whole system within matter of seconds then once you start the engine right once you start the engine what actually happens is the crank uh, engine cranks and it uh, 
when it is actually cranking so as long as uh, the ecu is turned on all of these sensor modules are turned on right all of these sensor modules are turned on so the cam position sensor is working cam position crank position air flow sensor and oxygen sensor all of them are actually working right all of them are actually working so when the engine started to crank right when the engine is started to crank the ecu now is actually registering values so reading the values from these sensors since airflow sensor is not giving any values it does not in try to inject any fuel into the injection inject uh, fuel into the uh, cylinder right as soon as engine started to crank the airflow sensor started to get air through it so it sensed by the ecu right then ecu check what is the crank and cam position sensor so from crank position sensor it can measure where is the piston now and what is the rpm of the engine right then uh, cam position sensor help is to understand just uh, now it's uh, whether the cam is uh, in a position where it's going to open the um, it's going to open the intake valve if the intake valve is about to open suddenly you see you can send a amount of fuel here uh, turn on the fuel injector and inject fuel into the cylinder right once the cylinder got fuel with the ignition system it combust and exhaust gas started to come out right exhaust gas started to come out from the exhaust uh, which measured by the oxygen sensor signal and send a feedback saying okay this is too rich you need to leave or you need to reduce the amount of fuel so as soon as, as soon as now engine is running now engine is running as soon as that value comes to the ecu again ecu okay now ecu understands okay now we have to reduce the amount of fuel so how to reduce the fuel amount of fuel we can't change the pressure what uh, fuel pressure regulator can fuel injector can do is it can actually uh, control the open duration the duration where the fuel is actually injected into the vein so uh, assuming uh, let's say it's 30 milliseconds so it can it's around 30 milliseconds usually from 30 to uh, if it is too rich at 30 milliseconds then it will reduce up to around 28 the 25 milliseconds if it is lean at 30 milliamp uh, 30 milliseconds it will be increased up to around 35 milliseconds right so we can actually see all of these things thanks to this obd thanks to the advancement of these electronic fuel injection systems now we can actually see all of these things operate in real time in our obd read obd means on book diagnostic which we will discuss later on so hopefully all of you understood what this means and how this works and everything uh, let me go to the next slide now even though i told that the whole system is uh very easy to start uh, even i explained the whole system as it is very easy to work with but uh, the real the actual case is quite difficult different it's not easy as it seems right the there are few issues of the uh, the of the a uh, full system i have proposed earlier number one is difficult cold starting so as you can remember uh, we did not in the carburetor fuel system we have choke valve to increase the vacuum and add more fuel into the uh, combustion chamber but here right but here we don't have that we do not have that so how to fix that right so three issues were there number one is difficult cold start number two is no idle fuel control right there is no idle speed control there is no way to control the idle a due to fuel control based on the feedback signal knocking could occur right so there is a possibility of knocking because we reduce the fuel and sometimes we increase the fuel right so we have to actually control these things 
so what we do is uh, first one is difficult cold starting so cold starting issue can be fixed very easily right so when engine is cold right when engine is cold if there is a method to understand whether the engine is cold or not then engine uh, since uh, fuel injector is operated right since fuel injector is operated electronically that fuel injector could keep the fuel injector open for a longer time right fuel injector can keep open for a long time for more fuel to be delivered to the combustion chain right so in order to do that we need to know the engine temperature so how can we know the engine temperature we need to add another sensor module or we need to add another input that's engine temperature so with this new system if the engine is cold right if the engine is cold then uh then what actually happens is this uh, a fuel injector keep kept open for a longer time periods adding more fuel to bring the engine up to the correct operating temperature right so in some cases uh, this one injector is not enough in such cases they add uh, one more injector which is known as the secondary fuel injector right second fuel injector is included just to done now the second problem is no idle fuel control right so during the idle right in idle since the throttle valve if you can remember uh, oh, in uh, carburetor system so idle we can actually control right if we need to increase the idle we have a small idle mixers idle screw that we can control by in addition to that one more thing is there are some components that are running for example if there is too much load at idle if the electric fan is running for example the ac if ac system is running the idle the engine is getting additional load the engine is getting a additional load to compensate for that engine actually have to screw, uh, increase its rpm in order to keep the engine running sustainable right to keep the engine running sustainable so with this arrangement we can't do it we can't do it uh, we have to use uh, some method in the carburetor system what we do what we have is we have a vacuum control vacuum actuator right vacuum actuator that can actually pull the throttle a little bit in order to increase the rpm a little bit by changing the manifold vacuum so uh, in these arrangement it's difficult to fix that but instead of that there is another component actually uh, included to the uh, throttle valve another output actually another output so what happened in here is if the engine is in under under idle if the engine has to increase the rpm due to a ac or some other components some other load is acting on the engine there is another bypass bar bypass air route right bypass air route that is controlled by a separate valve which is known as idle control valve right idle control valve this whole section is known as idle control valve the purpose of this is to actually run or operate the engine and operate the engine and change the engine speed at idle without the interference of the driver right without the interference of the driver so this auxiliary air regulator also known as idle control valve right idle control valve is directly controlled by the uh, directly controlled by the ecu itself right so this is actually integrated into this throttle housing now once everything is assembled it looks like this right it actually looks like this uh, so this is actually called as the throttle body once everything is actually attached so if you can see i'm pretty hopefully you can all of you can see here 
so this is where your throttle valve the throttle cable comes and connect and um, from there we have this side this is where the throttle position sensor is connected so there's a, a shaft going through and the wire either one one end of it is actually connected to your actuator pedal or the other end is actually connected to your uh, tpa so also known as throttle positioning sensor right then you have another section over here right another section over here so this is the part we are discussing now so this is where this is the bypass part also known as idle control valve so this is idle control valve and the control actuator is this one over here right the control actuator is this one over here right so this is directly controlled by the ecu itself to control the fuel control the i mean vehicle rp right uh, in addition to that you may be actually seeing there are three of uh, around two three uh, three uh, sort of like a connectors that can be fixed it something else right these are actually uh, uh, these are actually uh, coolant line the these these are actually coolant line the reason for using coolant line is it's not uh, that much applicable for countries like us uh, but for cold countries uh, when uh, this throttle is operating for a longer time because of uh, during especially during the winter uh, because of uh, lower temperature in the vacuum it actually started to freeze and create ice to avoid that this second uh, whole throttle body needed to be actually heated right to be heated to do that uh, it actually have this uh, also it actually connected to the coolant system of the paper okay so next one is the next problem is due to the fuel control based on feedback signal knocking could actually work right so since we are actually controlling the fuel especially we control the fuel based on the feedback signal it may go dangerously low or dangerously high creating knocking right knocking so knocking could be actually catastrophic so to avoid that we need to know uh, some system or we need to add the some system in order to find a way to identify if the engine is knocking so another sensor was introduced which is known as the knock sensor right it's called as the knock sensor right we will discuss about these things later as well so knock sensor is uh, so knock sensor is uh, not that much uh, uh, connected to the fuel system is more connected to the ignition system. That's what I told you from the beginning. This fuel system cannot be, uh, could not be just discussed it as a one single system, right? It could not be discussed as a single system. It is actually interfering or it's actually conjunction. It's actually working in conjunction with the uh, ignition system. So. This knock sensor is used to actually uh, measure the knocking, but it would not that much interfere with the fuel control, but it will be very much controlling the ignition timing. So if the knocking occurs, it will actually advance uh, the fuel ignition timing in order to uh, avoid the knocking again. We'll discuss about that one again later on. So once we fixed all of these components, right? Once we fixed all of these components into a single cylinder engine, this is what we ended up getting, right? This is what we ended up getting. So we have the idle speed. If you can see, if you <clears throat> get this properly, you have the airflow coming here, and uh, you have your output. Right. This is your in engine control module. You have output arrow comes this way and control the idle control valve here, idle speed control valve. And this whole section is the throttle assembly, right? Throttle assembly. And there's a special component called manifold absent manifold pressure sensor. So manifold pressure sensor is the one actually used here in order to measure the amount of air goes into the engine right in this case that is the sensor used here 
So for measuring the air, uh, amount of air goes inside the engine, we have different uh, around three types of uh, flow air sense, uh, air flow sensors. We'll discuss them uh, when we were discussing about the sensors and actuators, right? So this is used for the uh, identify how much of air, right? So this goes here and comes to the engine, right? Sorry, in CU. So then we have another output comes to the whole engine. So this is what actually being controlled. Right. And if you look at here properly, uh, you'll be able to see the engine temperature sensor also fixed here, crank position sensor also fixed over here. Right. Uh, in uh, addition to that, over here we have the catalytic converter, which we will discuss in the later later in the module, and uh, exhaust uh, exhaust manifold and our lambda sensor, also known as oxygen sensor, is here. That signal is also sent back to the uh, in electronic control module, right? So if you so there are like four or five inputs, but only two outputs there. Even from two outputs, one is just controlling one single, uh, just for use. Even with the idle gun speed control, the engine can actually run, but uh, with the full without full injection, it won't operate and uh, yeah as you can see over here as long as the battery is connected it's actually sending power to the ecu as well as all the sensors except for actuators actuators only will be actuated once these uh, uh, inputs started to get valid readings to them right uh, so this uh, particular uh, assembly this particular uh, engine is also fixed with the ignition coil and ignition coil is actually controlled from the electronic control unit over here. So this sort of system is actually known as DIS or distributorless ignition systems, right? This is something we call as distributorless ignition system that also divided into two different types, uh, waste, spark and uh, the, Coil on plug type. So we, we will be discussing those in the next class. Okay, so uh, one more thing. If you can remember what we have, or if, we, if you guys put, if you guys can remember what we discussed previously, we discussed about the having a crank positioning sensor and cam positioning sensor both. But in this, a particular application it only has a cam uh, crank positioning sensor right cam positioning sensor uh, it, it is actually uh, possible to run only with the crank positioning sensor but having a crank cam positioning sensor make it easier but uh, more than that if it is a single cylinder right if it is a single cylinder engine right similar to this one right is a single cylinder engine. So in a single cylinder engine, you can only run with the can question sensor, right? With the crank positioning sensor because you do not have to worry about the other cylinders. So you can actually make, uh, you can actually uh, keep track of the piston locations just using a crank positioning sensor. That's why this particular one actually having a uh, one, sensor crank portion sensor on so up to here we only discussed about single cylinders right up to here we only discussed about the single cylinder but the system actually get advanced when we go for even more cylinders but it's just operating it in a sequence that's it there's no much difference but before we go into there, we'll just discuss about the sensors and actuators that's been used in this, right? So we'll start with the throttle positioning sensor. So throttle positioning sensor as shown here uh, is actually a variable resistor. It's, it's a variable resistor. But you have to remember when I'm discussing here about sensors and actuators, I'm just going to discuss about the um, most used type. Right, mostly used types. There are other types of throttle positioning sensors as well, and there are other methods can be built. 
right? So only I'm talking about the ones more uh, very much available in the theater. So, okay, coming back to throttle position sensor. So in the throttle position sensor, it actually use a variable resistor, right? Variable resistor. So uh, these two images actually shows the outside of the throttle position sensor, but here, right here, it actually shows how it operates. So uh, it operates between zero and five, right? It, it operates between zero and five. So the when based on where the throttle valve is, this voltage between zero and five, it actually changed, right? It actually changed. But it uh, it's not possible to say whether at uh, rest that means during, at idle it's at uh, five volt or whether at uh, uh, sorry whether during idle whether if it is in four point five volts or whether if it is in uh, zero point five volts it's not possible to say only way to see that is to check with the multimeter right so these uh, that's this is the basic method for uh, them to op uh, in order to operate this, they need minimum of three wires, as you can see. One is ground, that means earth, and the five volt reference, and the output signal, right? This is the output signal. But in some cases, they have up to run five wires or five points. In such case, the fifth, uh, fourth, and fifth are uh, referred to the idle control valve. So the idle control valve is operational as long as the idle. Uh, the throttle valve is on idle position. So the idle control can be only controlled through the uh, throttle valve. That's why those uh, five, point five wire system is, uh, system actually exists. Uh, next, we'll go to the NOx sensor, but uh, remember that I'm not going based on what we discussed. I mean, not on the same, um, same way, but I just uh, put uh, sensors based on the space available. Some sensors need a little bit more space because they have different, few different types available. But here, just we can, I can discuss two sensors. That's why I put NOx sensor here. So NOx sensor is actually a piezoelectric sensor. The most, uh, uh, the one, uh, this piezoelectric sensor, is actually using a piece of ceramic, two pieces of piece of ceramics over here, right on top of each other with the vibrations due to, and it's actually directly bolted to the engine block. If there's any vibrations comes through them, uh, it actually uh, absorb them and these piezoelectric uh, ceramic modules started to move and that create a small voltage. That voltage is actually sensed by the uh, our ECU and based on that, it actually uh, control the ignition system, ignition. Uh, so, but here you have to remember this uh, NOx system will actually, or NOx sensor will even pick up very small vibrations that even us could not feel, right? Even us could not feel. So because of that, uh, this sometimes it's operation, sometimes we may feel that our uh, NOx sensor is faulty, but most of the time the vibration we could not offer, uh, even feel, it, right? So this actually measures everything and it sends back and do all the Correction less than a uh, second, so we won't actually see any difference where when this is actually operating. So yes, now we have the crank and camshaft positioning sensor. It's not TPS; it's crank and camshaft positioning sensor. There are two corrections. Yes. So uh, this actually used uh, or this actually provide the location of the cam and crankshaft while providing the engine RP. So there are three types actually available. Number one is variable reluctance sensor, number two is hole effect sensor and the number three is the optical sensor. Most widely used one is the hole effect sensor. Uh, if you look at over there on the first image it actually shows 
how uh, it actually operates. It has it's contained in the tooted wheel with this particular uh, sensor. Except for optical sensor, uh, both of the either both of the other two types of sensors looks like the same from outside. Okay, so. Uh, the top image actually shows how it operates. It basically picks up when there's these tooth comes close to this particular uh, head over here. When it comes to clo uh, come close to it, it actually generate a signal, right? Both the uh, number one and number two types of sensors. But uh, and when the RPM increases, when the RPM increases, the frequency, the frequency of this signal also increases. The Therefore, engine can actually calculate how much of the uh, how much is the RPM, right? How much is the RPM? So, in order to find out the uh, first cylinder, what they have is they have a gap. So you can see one, two, three, four over here, right? Assume that uh, your first cylinder ignition or first cylinder valve opening time is over here. If it is the place. For first cylinder, if this is the place for first cylinder, there will not be a tooth here. So at that time, your graph output of your graph will be something like this. So first one, then you have gap. Again, you have the same gap, right? So with that. With, sorry, with this, right? with this is you can identify when the first cylinder is actually fired. So that's how it actually measures the cylinder. So first cylinder, if we know where the first cylinder from there onward, it can actually calculate where the other cylinders are because these are evenly spaced. So uh, the difference between these two, uh, like first one and the second one is, uh, basically the output if you uh, so you can see here the variable reluctance sensor is actually giving a sinusoidal wave but in the uh, all effect sensor is directly provide as a zero to five volt also known as a uh, digital signal so we can directly use this in the uh, ecu so this is more widely used nowadays and it's more reliable so optical sensor is very much similar to this only difference is instead of having a tooth and wheel it's just have a wheel with the hole right wheel with the hole so that uh, something like a infrared led is used in order to get the infrared signal back if there's a hole or a black color mark it won't actually return back so from that it'll identify where the first cylinder uh, from the owners it can actually count the difference between this, uh, the only disadvantage of this uh, optical sensor type is that uh, having optical sensor means the, the crankshaft area, right? Crankshaft area should be very clear. It should not be having any debris or anything to obstruct the view, right? But uh, it's uh, quite a bit difficult. So most of the time, these optical sensors are not in use, but in some cases these are being used in the um, camp shop where less oil is there to actually contaminate the area. Okay, uh, next we move to the airflow sensor. So uh, airflow sensor actually measures how much of air comes in there into the engine and we have three types of air sensors, flow sensors. Number one is actually known as vane type air flow meter. Number two is known as absolute uh, pressure sensor, manifold absolute pressure sensor, MAP, and uh, mass air flow sensor, also known as MAF. Right? So, vane type air flow meter is the one mostly used previously, like uh, in the 80s, it was the first type of uh, air flow sensors used. It's very uh, simple. It's very much similar to the uh, throttle positioning sensor. What it has is a sort of like a hole with the vein inside. So this vein can, based on how much of air flow through, right, 
how much of air through blows through here uh, it actually right uh, it actually uh, connected over resistor over here right this is again a variable resistor so based on how much of this the vein or this flap is open it can actually identify or it will send a certain amount of voltage that voltage is actually used for uh, uh, used by the ecu to uh, identify or ic uh, ecu to calculate not calculate actually find the amount of fuel has to be uh, put into the engine so i can actually show you one of these just give me i actually have so hopefully you all can see me okay you guys can see me right okay, i need to remove the background one second huh? Okay, so I don't know whether you can see this properly. So this is a vein type. This is a vein type air flow sensor, and this is a vein type air flow sensor. So uh, now you can see it properly, right? If you compare, if you compare with this one over here, so you can still see this shape, right? You guys can still see this shape over. Here. That curved uh, sort of shape, right? So the vein is actually. So I'm not excited. So this is the vein I told you about. So it's open all the way through, right? Vein is open all the way through, right? So once, uh, so this side is. So there are two sides. So this is where the airflow actually comes from here, and it goes to the engine from this way. Right, it goes to the engine from this way. So airflow goes through right there. So like that airflow goes. So this is where the uh, resistive part, that resistor part is actually situated over here. Right. And uh, if you can see, so when this is actually opening, there's a resistor here. Unfortunately, I can't open this this is sealed so if i open it i'm going to break it so i don't want to do it this is working one so i don't want to break it and so you can see there are a lot of hopefully you can see there are few pins the light is not enough so there are around seven pins here right seven pins here one thing about these are these are also connected to the uh, fuel pump. So the reason being, this is the most uh, uh, front per part of the vehicle. So if there is any accident, this will get damaged. So in such case, in order to switch off the fuel systems or the fuel system uh, relay, turn on relay also actually goes through this module over here. And there's a, another part called, if you can see here, there's a mixture part, right? There's a mixture screw here. So this is where the mixture screw is actually located. So from here, this can actually do small mixer adjustment. But uh, this is almost obsolete now. The problem being this, ha this has a lot of issues. One main problem is there's a vein here, right? So there's a vein here, the amount of air actually comes in and the amount of uh, air actually have to uh, be used in order to open this uh, has a small difference. Right, there's a small difference. So the values coming from this sort of a uh, air uh, flow sensor is not exactly correct. So because of that, at the moment, these are not available. But if you look at the vehicle made in 80s, 90, uh, 80s and uh, early 90s, you can actually find uh, these 
how available and uh, these are pretty expensive now since these are very hard to find nowadays uh, one of these uh, costs around 25000 but uh, comparing to next sensor we are talking about the manifold absolute pressure sensor recondition one this is also recondition one is around 25000 that one is around 3000 to 7000 rupees right so because of this issue with this uh, open this flap Right, this is the this is actually spring loaded. This is actually spring loaded from here, so it will come. It will actually go back as long as long as there is no vacuum from inside. So if we move to the next uh, sensor, so next we have the um, vacuum sensor, manifold. Uh, sorry, map sensor. So map sensor is. Uh, somewhat different and it's very compact the advantage of this one is the accurate readings accurate reading so accurate reading and it's not that much expensive uh, so these are widely used these are actually widely used what they have is a they have like a sort of like a small silicon chip right small silicon chip inside a vacuum chamber uh, that uh, that um, that generate a signal based on the uh, based on the uh, manifold pressure it's actually uh, receiving, right? So next one is uh, mass air flow sensor. So this manifold absolute pressure sensor is available from like nineties until now. Nowadays, the manifold absolute pressure sensors being used uh, in petrol vehicle as well as diesel vehicle. Right, as well as diesel vehicles in order to meter the fuel, meter the fuel exactly correctly based on the amount of air, right, amount of air comes inside. So next one is mass air flow sensor, MAF, the most popular and the most widely used type of air flow sensors at the moment are MAF sensors. So MAF sensors, uh, one advantage of the absolute manifold, absolute pressure sensor is you can even run it without a air filter compared to the other two well the first two is you can even run without a uh, air filter it won't make any damage right but third one you can't do it the problem here is it's actually used two wires right this uh, the third one manifold uh, sorry mass air flow sensor mass sensor is uh, actually uses the resistance still it's used the resistance resistivity in order to find out how much of air flows through the uh, system right uh, the issue here is it, uh, uh, issue here is this is very sensitive to small changes right small changes and uh, one more advantage is it can actually measure how much of the air temperature also, right air temperature also so uh, Temperature is also additionally supporting. It helps to provide more control over the fuel injection. So having temperature is better. So if you are using a manifold absolute pressure sensor, you need to have a separate uh, voltage, um, uh, separate sensor in order to measure the uh, air temperature, right? Air temperature. So, without uh, the manifold absolute pressure MAF sensor, you have both of them in one single sensor. So, what how it actually works is it has two uh, two wires. One is actually heated, and uh, based on the air flow, it's actually getting cold, right? When the air flows through, that uh, that wire actually changes the temperature. So that temperature changes ultimately provide the resistance change, right? Resistance change. That resistance change is actually used to find out the find how much of air being uh, flowed through to the combustion uh, flow through into the engine, right? So uh, one disadvantage of this thing is uh, this uh, mass air flow sensor is it need a very good filtering system. Yeah, if not, the air flow sensor could get actually damaged. And in addition to that, it actually needs a proper cleaning, proper cleaning and we aim for other 
air flow say air flow meters and uh, and the absolute pressure sensor or map sensor you can even use well map sensor do not need any cleaning but the absolute vane type air flow sensor you can even use a carburetor cleaner but uh, since there's no uh, delicate electronics in the vane but in the map mass air flow sensor you need to use a proper chemical compounds to clean it to avoid any damages to these uh, delicate wires inside these two delicate wires inside there right uh, okay uh, yeah one more thing map sensor accuracy is very high comparing to the other two especially to the number one the main type so next we move to the oxygen sensor. So oxygen sensor, we also call it as lambda sensor. The reason for calling it as lambda sensor is, uh, lambda is actually used as the represent, uh, lambda actually represents the stoichiometric air flow rate, right? Stoichiometric air flow ratio is 14.7 to one. So 14.7 parts of air to one part of fluid, right? that is equal to lambda 1 lambda e1 is that right so uh, the this particular type of sensor what it does is it compare the atmospheric air and the exhaust air and find out and based on these two comparison it generate a electric current right electric current that provided around four from like uh, zero to 800 milliold of uh, millivolts uh, that milli based on the oxygen uh, present in the exhaust gas and it uh, it actually compares or oh, how do I say this? Well, basically it's like this. So. Okay, so this is a cutway of the lambda sensor, right? So lambda sensor, this section over here, this is where the electricity is actually generated. So it's actually made of strinkonium dioxide ceramic, right? Strinkonium dioxide ceramic. So it's uh, one side of it or the outside of it actually open to the exhaust gas, right? So this is the exhaust pipe. And the inside of this strinkonium dioxide components is actually open to the atmospheric air. So since this is now in contact with the atmospheric air and the, the air from the, the exhaust gas based on the oxygen, based on the variation of oxygen, uh, oxygen between the atmospheric air and the uh, in the and the uh, uh, exhaust gas it's create a voltage a small voltage between like 0 to 800 millivolts right 0 to 800 millivolts so if it is like um the if if it is a stoichiometric or stoichiometric uh, combustion if it is properly combusted that means lambda should be one at lambda is one the uh, sensor produce approximately around 450 millivolts, right? 450 millivolts. So, uh, and uh, 450 millivolts, but it actually changes from like uh, 0 to 800 millivolts based on whether the fuel mixture is rich or if it is uh, lean, right? So, if it is lean, if it is lean means there's not much oxygen present. There's two, uh, there's actually, so, ox, there's uh, much oxygen present in the exhaust. So uh, with that, the difference between these two are lower. So lower current will actually generate. But in the rich mixer, if you have more fuel, less air inside, 
then uh, the differential is higher so low higher voltage that means 800 near to 800 millivolt will come so that's why there's rich and weak weak means it's lower than lambda equals 1 which means it's higher than lambda equals 1 so uh, this is what the output actually comes from that output will be um, changed or it will be amplified into 0 to 12 voltage once it starts the signal will be something like that so what actually happens we will be discuss later or so in the next part we will discuss how this actually operate uh, before we do that we will just go through the actuator part so actuator is actually the fuel injector so fuel injector Yeah, fuel injector controls how much of fuel goes into the combustion chamber. So in order to do that, it uses a solenoid valve. Solenoid valve con controlled by a electric signal. So the fuel is always comes into the injector, but it's closed at the correct time for a predetermined time duration only. This injector will actually open right and will open so this operation opening and closing time is uh, calculated not actually calculated uh, provided by the ECU uh, based on the inputs that we discussed earlier inputs and the feedback that we discussed earlier so uh, there are different types of fuel injectors so diesel engines and petrol engine fuel injectors are different the main difference being uh, diesel engines operate at higher pressure since they have their fuel injectors are directly injecting fuel into the combustion chamber or at least into the engine. But in the petrol engine, the fuel injection is not done directly into the engine itself but to the uh, port. Right? We will discuss that part second in a few slides after we will be coming back to that section. So, um, yeah, so basically petrol fuel injectors are known as low pressure fuel injectors. The diesel injectors are high pressure fuel injectors. So you can see a small cutway of the fuel injector. The main, main purpose of a fuel injector is to spray fuel very well in order for it to be atomized better for have to have a very good air fuel mixture right so we call this i'm actually again so this fuel injection part i'm actually going through uh, very complex sections uh, but i'm not going into too deep i just give you a brief introduction only so this uh, fuel injection the injection patterns why this atomization how the flame start, where the flame propagates. So there's a lot of things uh, related to this that we need to discuss if you need to learn a bit more. I think some videos are available in the YouTube also in the same channel that I post these videos. If you prefer, you can actually go ahead and watch them or I can give you some documents or books sort of things for reading. Uh, anyway, if you are following on mobile, you discussing and seeing and how to kind of this atomization and everything okay so uh, coming back to the topic so these fuel injectors uh, the main purpose is to actually do a fine amount of fuel and uh, atomizing to, for it to be atomized and be, well be mixed with the uh, air so uh, fuel injectors are actually classified as two types of injectors number one is uh, actually how they feed so they are classified in how they feed there are other classifications also but uh, usually the most, most easiest way to see them is uh, how they actually uh, uh, yeah how they actually feed feed means how the fuel is coming uh, into the cilia injector itself so if you can see over here all of these injectors shown here are actually top feed injectors right these are top feed injectors there's other type called side feed injectors 
top four, top fuel injectors means the fuel actually comes through the top of the injector and fuel moves through the injector into the uh, needle itself but uh, let me just show you a side feed injector i'm not exactly sure whether you will be able to see this Okay, so this is a side feed injector. Hopefully you all can see. It. So the difference between the top feed injector and side feed injector is, can't see it. So, so over here, top of the injector, there's actually a hole, right? There's actually a hole in the top feed injector, but there's nothing on the body of the injector, right? There's nothing on the body of the injector, right? But in this injector, if you see very well, can you see like a small mesh over here? So this is called a microfilter, right? This is called a microfilter. In addition to the fuel filter, you have it uh, in the fuel part of the fuel system. You have a small filter called as microfilter here to even uh, catch any other even finer material over here, right? So this is where the fuel is actually injected in this. So the side feed, side feed means there are openings all around it. So uh, the type of fuel rail can be used for these are particularly different, right? Mostly these sort of fuel injectors only can be seen in uh, high performance applications. And if there's no other space or something to fix the injector, Right. In such cases, the other type of injector, this type of injector is available unless uh, there are other requirements. Only reason for using these is to actually use in high performance applications since there's a uh, uh, lot more opening around the injector, it can actually feed more fuel through this. So that's why this type of fuel injector is being used and uh, the problem of this sort of fuel injector is uh, the fuel rail construction of the fuel race is rail is very complex so that will be expensive to that part will be expensive to make so uh, there are two more things i would actually like to show hoping you can, so hoping you all can see this. so the color right so these injectors are classified basically classified based on the color right so for each manufacturer, they have a certain type of color. So this is more like a beige sort of yellow color, right? Beige sort of yellowish color, it's yellow, beige, right? So for this particular application, so this is side feed injectors. The side feed injectors also, they have different color codes. And for the top feed the injectors also, there's a separate uh, uh, color codes, right? So this is a, a Denso fuel injector. So each manufacturer has different injectors. So Denso, so this is from my car. So this is a, um, a Toyota used one. So uh, Toyota basically used Denso. Denso is actually owned by Toyota. So uh, this color represents how much of fuel actually being delivered per minute. So these were actually, uh, the specification of these injectors actually comes as Fuel injection, right? Fuel injection uh, time, right? Fuel injection time. The fuel injection time, the amount of fuel injector can be delivered, right? Can be delivered through this. So uh, for these, right, it's measured in cubic centimeters per minute. Cubic centimeters per minute. Uh, so this fuel injector can actually deliver uh, 200 and 73, 270 something, 270 something fuel, uh, cubic centimeters of fuel within a minute, right? Within a minute. So that's how these are actually classified. So this specification, in order to find this specification, you can check the color and the, how the fuel is actually uh, introduced or how the fuel is fed into the system. In addition to that, there's a small number here you can actually read for more details but that's the manufacturer's part number through the manufacturer's part number also you can find but once you fix this in the engine it's almost impossible to find read the, uh, this number over here 
okay so i think that's quite a bit more information uh on uh, injectors once you come to the university i think i'll be able to show you a little bit more into this uh, so over here you you have this uh, so this is a uh, normal indirect injection injectors and over here this steel one this is the one used in the diesel air vehicle which is made in steel alloyed steel and uh, also in gdi engines gasoline direct injection which we will be discussing at the end of this module okay uh, we we'll move to the next part which is engine management right so uh, this engine management section is where i'm going to actually struggle the reason for struggle means i have to struggle uh, basically because uh, the engine management will not work as a single unit for fuel and a single a single control system for efi or the for, sorry ignition system so basically it actually a combination of both right it's a combination of both but uh, let me just explain through this very simply and we will be coming back to this topic again with more details in the ignition system module because with the dual angles and dual angle ignition angle how the fuel uh, propag uh, yeah, fire propagation and everything actually uh, comes to play with the engine management so basically engine management system starts is to maintain the engine's operation maintain operating the engine at its optimum condition so in order to do that it takes the feedback from the uh, lambda sensor and control the fuel uh, based on the inputs as well right in addition to that in such cases as uh, ac operation if you turn on the ac in order to compensate for the additional engine load engine rpm has to be increased so to do that uh this actually use the engine management system know how to actually uh, control that in uh, as we discussed earlier in our previous module we have a uh, something called a idle control valve if the ac is turned on the engine control module or the engine management system knows okay ac is turned on now i have to increase the engine rpm so then it automatically increase the engine rpm to keep the engine running without turning off okay so that's what the basic uh, purpose of the engine management so in the engine management there is a one important part that is air fuel ratio right air fuel ratio so in order to maintain air fuel ratio that means our lambda right lambda we need to maintain lambda if it is if lambda is one that is super so the main purpose of the engine management system is to maintain uh, lambda at 1 at all costs right at all costs so basically how it works is uh, the sensor the lambda sensor which we discussed earlier generate voltage between 0 and 800 millivolt but most of it mostly the voltage is uh, delivered the voltage is produced between around 150 uh, millivolts to so, uh, 600 millivolts this is the main region but during this region it's actually one right it should be one so this means we have stoichiometric air fuel ratio okay so uh, the engine always try to maintain the air fuel ratio at this constant level but it is not possible it's very difficult how it works is now as in the engine is running engine is running the exhaust is coming so once the exhaust is coming it uh, rate around 250 millivolts so 250 millivolt is uh, in range but in order for it to be Uh, almost 100% accurate it should be near to 100 millivolts volts 400 millivolts so 450 millivolts usually it's around 450 millivolts so to bring the 
air fuel ratio up to that level now it's 200 millivolts so 200 let's say 200 millivolts so from 200 millivolts the ecu rates that it's at 200 millivolts so now as you understand if we have to increase the amount of fuel goes there so we increase the amount of fuel a little bit right but it can't measure exactly this much it won't be able to measure exactly this much so it increased the fuel amount little by little right little by little it increase and as soon as it passes this 400 millivolts it's uh 400 milli is uh, after a certain time the voltage sensor voltage or our lambda voltage goes beyond our particular limit say 400 millivolts it goes beyond 400 millivolt so now it's going rich now uh, engine understand okay now it's going rich now we have to reduce the voltage now we have to reduce the fuel amount so we turn reduce the time fuel injector kept open so now we reduce so now we have reached up to a reach now from there onwards fuel mixture has to be uh, leaned so time the fuel injector time will be reduced to reduce the amount of fuel going in again it will go weak as soon as it goes to the weak again it the system or the issue increase the fuel so this cycle it reduces the fuel and once it goes lower than 400 millivolts it increases but once it increases the by the time it actually reached the uh, correct value it will go a little bit more than 400 millivolts it again changes so this cycle continues right this cycle continues this cycle happens in a very small time we can't even feel it but if we draw it in a uh, normal time graph, time graph that means like a uh, graph similar to like our usual uh, with our like seconds not milliseconds if we draw it like in seconds this actually almost comes like a straight line right it actually comes like a straight line okay so this is how the system actually works but while this is actually moving up and down, when the fuel is actually controlled by the ECU, that tend to uh, create tendency for knocking because less fuel means too much oxygen in there, right? And it could increase the temperature of the uh, combustion chamber and the engine dangerously. So in such cases, engine needs to actually compensate for that. So for those reasons, the ignition system and the engine temperature, engine temperature values also being actually considered here. One way is in some cases, engine becomes, so when engine goes lean, right? When engine goes leaner and leaner, it created high temperature, very high temperature in just in the combustion chamber. So to, uh, avoid, so to fix that, only way is to add a little bit of more fuel to cool down the combustion chamber to avoid further damage, right? So this is how the system works. It's complicated than I, I'm actually saying, but uh, will be learned later on these sort of things. So even though ECU does this, in order for ECU to do this, we actually have to give all of these values, right? So all of these values, for, for example, at zero, uh, when the when it uh, received a 0 0.4 millivolts, right, 0 0.2 millivolts, the ECU have to find, okay, 0 0.4 millivolts, okay, at 0 0.4 millivolts, how much of fuel I have to increase at this particular RPM of the engine in order to keep the engine running while increasing the, uh, while bringing up the uh, bringing the engine up to the sorry while bringing the engine up to, uh, while bringing the lambda up to one right so that's how it actually works it does not do any calculations there's no calculations included in the ecu it just goes and find the correct value and implement it so in order to find the cal uh, correct value engine should have or the engine control module need to have the correct uh values already inside of it right so these are actually called fuel maps fuel maps sorry fuel maps so fuel map means uh it has a 
certain sort of number of values, right? Number of values of fuel and air, right? Air and fuel in its uh, uh, in its uh, computer already stored, right? Already stored. From this only engine actually takes and read and implement it, right? So this is what actually the fuel map looks like. Sorry, this one is the fuel map. So if we draw the fuel map, this is what we ended up. So we have RPM load and uh, something else here, right? So this is not exactly the fuel map. The shape is somewhat similar to this. So it's like a 3D graph. So you have a 3D surface once you fully completely assemble it. So you uh, with the RPM increases and how the RPM reduces, right? RPM reduces and with the load. So this blue color area is good for the engine. And here it's actually yellow color area is good. So each color is actually representing whether the engine is lean or uh, uh, whether the engine is actually leaner or engine is actually red. So red means actually a rich mixer and uh, blue, is the lean and yellow, sorry, green is the uh, big. Okay, and uh, we usually need to maintain around orange color. Uh, that means 14.7. So around this orange area, that is where the engine is actually operating at lambda is one. So lambda is one is the best possible operating condition. But, but there are other things also to be this uh, considered. So, just with this fuel map engine uh, engine can actually run engine can actually run but it won't be efficient so in order to make it 100 uh, very efficient it's need to actually compare these values or com uh, combine these values with the ignition map a similar map available for the fuel inject sorry uh, inject uh, ignition timing so ignition timing also is important for here so that's why i said it's impossible to actually explain this one uh, without the ignition system so we will be discussing that again later on so here it's actually showing only the uh, uh what do you call this lambda values but uh it's not only lambda values it's some uh, this is just showing the fuel uh, rpm and the lambda value but here it's actually showing the rpm and load and uh, i'm not exactly sure what is e, e means here Hundred and forty. Hundred and forty usually goes to uh, manifold pressure, something like that. Anyway, so anyway, the shape is somewhat like this. So uh, to find out, so in order to bring give this data, first once an engine is manufactured, it has to be extensively tested for each and every RPM, right? Each and every RPM. So each and every position, every point over here has to be actually map, mapped manually. So to do that, uh, there's uh, one equipment use. It's called as the engine dynamometer. So the image shown in the right is actually an engine dynamometer, where it actually, uh, where this uh, particular person is fixed the engine into a dynamometer, where uh, you measure the engine performance and change the values in this full map uh while working right so the second one is actually called as a chassis dynamometer where once the engine is actually fixed into the car uh unless we take the engine out to fix into a unit like this it's almost impossible to run but uh, what we can what is what's possible is what's possible is uh, <clears throat> uh the dynamo chassis dynamometer the chassis dynamometer can actually measure the engine parameters without taking the engine off. So this is something uh, very much common compared to the engine dynamometer because this needs more, uh, uh, well, it's difficult to do because you have to take the engine now. But this is very much common, uh, uh, common occurrences. And in Sri Lanka also, we have uh, both of these things uh, uh, doing. So one, if we, yeah, before we go further, if we come back to this engine fuel map, uh, these fuel maps can be actually changed. 
so from the manufacturer they we are not supposed to change it we are not supposed to change it so fuel maps and everything actually uh, made by the uh, manufacturer they were put into the electronic control module or ecu and they were not to be tampered with but it is possible to do uh, something called a flash since this is electronic chip inside the something called chip tuning you might have heard that chip tuning means that so we can actually flash and change these values if we change these value we can actually uh, gain little bit of more power so when the manufacturer actually manufacture a vehicle so they do not, especially we start with the engine if they manufacture when they manufacture an engine they do not manufacture a specific engine for a specific car so this engine uh, engine is manufactured to be used in few different vehicles so each different vehicle need different characteristics from the engine so based on that these fuel maps were actually made so if you prefer to change the characteristic if you need a little bit of more power this engine map can be accessed and can be uh, changed and have a little bit of more power but in order to do that you need a a uh, few specialized equipment and one of the main important equipment is this particular part over here which particular equipment over here the engine dan sorry chassis dynamometer right in addition to that you need to have a very good uh, train on uh, training on these things how to change the values and numbers on these things because if you change it too much or if you do it wrongly you may end up actually by killing your engine Right, you may end up overstressing your engine, so you should not actually interfere. It's not an actually difficult thing to do, but uh, the remapping or remapping this, adding these all of these values again is quite difficult. Uh, the rest of the part, the reading and uh, putting it back, is uh, somewhat easy. Somewhat comparing comparatively, somewhat easy. So uh, yeah, before I go, uh, not all the vehicles can do this. Like uh, vehicles made in eighties and nineties can't actually. Uh, we can't actually reprogram them, but uh, vehicles are made up like two thousand can be reprogrammed very easily. But for the vehicles that cannot be reprogrammed, right? Cannot be reprogrammed can use a certain uh, item called standalone ECUs. We have something called standalone ECUs, specially designed to. Uh, fixed into high horsepower engines and sort of applications, uh, which are very expensive, but can be fixed into any engine and can uh, use a completely a new map to run it properly. Okay, so fuel injection for multi-cylinder engines. Okay, so. Uh, up to now, we only discuss about the single point, single cylinder engine, so single cylinder and single injector. But when we come to the multi cylinder engines, multi cylinder engine fuel injection had to be a bit different. That's why I told you that we need a crankshaft sensor and a camshaft, right? So it actually gives a sensor sense where each piston now, which valves are going to be open and closed. So uh, fuel injection system actually classified into two mainly. First one is single point fuel injection. So the this is the first one actually came. So single point fuel injection means even if you have four cylinders or five cylinders or six cylinders, you only have one single injector, similar to the carburetor, right? Similar to the carburetor. So disadvantage of this is you can't actually uh, properly meter the correct amount of fuel should be goes into each cylinder. Right? It's impossible to meet that the amount of fuel should go into each cylinder. So to fix this, uh, uh, well, this is actually fixed into the throttle body just before the throttle body because yeah, just before the throttle body. And uh, so yeah, as I told you, the only problem is that uh, fuel cannot be metered properly. In addition to that, for cold starting this uh, in these sort of engines, it may need uh, another additional uh, injector to provide fuel into uh, all four cylinders because you need that fuel a little bit more than what you what it usually uh, injects. So uh, this uh, so that's uh, how the system actually works in these injectors.
so next we have multipoint pole injection multipoint pole injection means each cylinder has a separate injector so in this case you need to actually have what we discussed earlier the cam uh, cam sensor and the cam shaft sensor helps over here to identify which cylinder is going to fire next so uh, multipoint pole injector also known as mpfy uh, so having single injector for single cylinder means you have a greater control over each cylinder but uh, this is also divided into two types number one is indirect pole well injection so indirect pole well injection uh, in the petrol engine we call it as petrol uh, port fuel well injection port fuel well injection in the direct uh, in the diesel injection we call it as indirect fuel well injection so indirect fuel uh, well injection in a diesel uh, electronic control fuel well system is uh, as same as the usual indirect fuel injection engine where the fuel is injected into a separate chamber which is, uh, which is adjacent to the combustion chamber in the, the indirect fuel injection in the petrol engine is actually port injection this is where if you go and look at a petrol engine fuel injector you may see the fuel injector is actually injecting fuel just before the intake valve right so intake port we call it as intake port so the fuel is actually injected to the inject port through the injected port injector intake port when just before the valve open right just before the valves open the fuel is injected through uh, this advantage is why it needs more fuel and the fuel has to be mixed the by the turbulent air flow right that's the only disadvantage of this but uh, since it is working in a no less uh, less atmospheric pressure for the atomization is actually lower so next uh, indirect fuel injection k so indirect in, uh, sorry next direct injection k in the direct injection petrol engines are known as gdi gasoline direct injection but in the petrol and diesel engine they are known as crdi you know they get crdi common rail direct injection fuel system right so these names uh, just don't uh, try to uh, mix these names these may also uh, uh, gdi sometimes use it as a, a, a trade name also but it's also a name used for describing all the uh indirect injection sorry uh, direct injection petrol engines so uh, difference if you see here you can actually see this is injected just before the intake valve this is the uh, indirect petrol engine and this is the direct injection so the injector directly inject into the combustion chamber and the injector shape and size wise also different so since this is operating at a higher temperature it has to be made with the material it can actually withstand the higher operating pressures right so this is uh, just a normal pressure injector as i shown you earlier so the complete fuel injection system now if we come to the complete fuel injection system it's something like that so each cylinder has a separate injector so i don't think i have to go through this again and again so you have fuel fuel pump and fuel filter then you the fuel is comes into this compound this is called a common rail right common rail all the injectors are actually connected to this so the fuel is actually pressurized and sent up to here and maintaining of this fuel pressure of this component is actually done by this particular part over here right this particular part over here this is called as a fuel pressure regulator right so it's maintain the fuel pressure over here and uh, if the pressure is too much the fuel will be returned back to the fuel supply but uh, there are a different arrangement of these also some have the fuel pressure regulator here some have the fuel pressure regulator inside the fuel pump some have fuel pressure regulator in between so this fuel pressure regulator if it is operated by the vacuum pressure then it has to come with the fuel pressure fuel rail so at the end of the fuel rail you might have seen it's like a certain like a cylindrical component if there's like a cylindrical component that's a fuel pressure regulator 
if it is possible, I will try to show you full pressure regulator and the whole system in the uh, next, uh, yeah, four injectors are connected here. Then four injectors are connected by the electron control unit or ECU. Then we have the throttle portion, coolant temperature, oil temp, engine oxygen engine temperature, intake air temperature, right? So this one take air intake temperature as well. So this oil temperature is measured specially to understand if the combustion chamber is getting overheated, right? Getting overheated because the the temperature heat of the combustion chamber and the piston is mainly absorbed by the oil, not coolant. So disadvantages wise, uh, these sort of uh, fuel injection system, the old fuel injection system, uh, or the previous fuel injection systems that we use, so because I'm now going to go with the modern fuel injection system, the one fuel injection system that we used to have, is they need a regular maintenance because you have a cable throttle with the electronic actuator tied to control valve. So these need to be properly maintained and need to be clean, right? And fuel atomization and fuel delivery could not be actually uh, optimized. In these fuel uh, delivery could not be optimized, right? And uh, maximum airflow ratio or the lambda value, the lean leaner it gets, it cannot get leaner than a certain value because of the difficulty in fuel atomizations. Uh, as a result of that, direct gasoline direct injection system was introduced. Okay, so again, before I go, this is actually a side feed type, so top feed type, top feed type. So this is the fuel rail over here, and right? this is the fuel rail over here, and this one should be written. Uh, no, well, supply line. It's impossible to see, impossible to pay without seeing the whole rail. Okay, so this is where the fuel is actually submit, uh, <coughs> provided to the injector. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so next we move into the diesel fuel injection system now. Uh, I'm not going to take much more time. It's only for yeah, around half an hour. So diesel fuel in, uh, fuel injection system is now very much familiar, very much similar to the petrol fuel injection type, right? Petrol fuel injection type. So uh, there are few differences. There are few differences. We start with the. I will actually explain this before I go into the gasoline direct injection system because gasoline direct injection system is very much similar to this right so now this uh, electronic fuel injection system for the petrol and diesel engines even though they are operating in different uh, uh, cycles the system wise the basic construction wise they are very much similar the sensors and everything they are much similar even nowadays they are even have a throttle valve right? they even have a throttle valve We'll discuss those things later. So, if we start from the fuel tank, we have a fuel tank, but uh, instead of the, uh, a fuel pressure pump, we only have a lift pump, which will be send, which will send the fuel through a fuel filter up to a high pressure fuel pump. So, this high pressure fuel pump probably may be run by electricity or may be run by uh, mechanical, uh, probably will be mechanical power. So. Most of the time for direct injection engine, they are actually run uh, mechanically run by the engine because of the electronic. Uh, so electric motors uh, are not possible, uh, not capable of achieving uh, that high pressure around 40,000 psi pressure at the moment. So um, next high pressure fuel is uh, the pressurized fuel is delivered up to the pressure regulator. So pressure regulator in this case is not actually uh, yeah pressure sensor. So there's a pressure sensor in the pressure regulator itself. So it mesh, uh, measures the pressure and sends the signal to the electronic control module. So the idea here is since engine does not have a vacuum in this, 
it means to maintain the fuel pressure so it does it by measuring the fuel pressure and switching off and switching on the uh, high pressure fuel line or uh, connecting and disconnecting the fuel pressure high pressure fuel into the pressure regulator so to do that it actually has a separate valve in the high pressure fuel pump so that's why there is a output or actuator actuator output coming going out from the ecu in red color right in red color so next the fuel pressure uh, delivered up to the fuel injector right fuel injector then uh, as we know fuel injector has a fuel uh, fuel injector is controlled by the ecu itself so if we go back to the starting from the top for uh, top left corner we have the throttle paddle that means the accelerator paddle we don't have the throttle valve here we have the throttle paddle so diesel engines do not have throttle valve they have throttle paddle so throttle paddle means we only control the pet diesel amount so here also throttle paddle actually sends the throttle position sensor we have a throttle position sensor to uh, identify the load amount the engine load or the how much of uh, power we request the driver request that signal goes directly to the ecu in and similar to the petrol engine it also have the cam position and crank position sensors going up to the ecu and in order to meter the fuel it's need to know how much of air so properly meter the fuel it needs to know how much of air goes in there so you still have the air flow sensor and for closed loop system you still have the exhaust and the oxygen sensor or lambda sensors and the ecu uh, about the combustion quality so combustion quality is measured and if it is okay then we keep the fuel up there or change the fuel right so again it's actually change the fuel injection time right it changes the fuel injection time based on uh, inputs and the feedback but you can see in addition to that there's a another line going from fuel injector to the ecu the reason being is the, the diesel fuel injection system the modern the advanced fuel injection system actually has a piezoelectric sensor right piezoelectric sensor inside the uh, injector itself to send the, the fuel injection sensor the fuel and the delivery pressure of the uh, fuel in, uh, as a signal to the ecu for the proper optimization of Where even higher optimization can be actually achieved by this. So basically, this is how the diesel electronic fuel injection system works. So, uh, somewhat some section of this actually very much similar to the petrol fuel injection system, but basically it's operate in a higher pressure condition, right? Higher pressure condition. So once we combine all of these. Right. Once we combine all of these things, finally we get a uh, something like this. Right. Something like this. So we have uh, the fuel comes through the filter and goes up to the fuel high pressure fuel pump. So as you can see over there, it's a mechanical pump. It's a mechanical pump, which which actually uh, sends the high pr pressurized fuel in the red color. up to the fuel rail right so this is the fuel rail right fuel rail is here and we have a fuel pressure sensor here right fuel pressure sensor here so fuel pressure sensor here and it measures how much of fuel pressure over here in the common rail common rail fuel pressure sensor sends the signal to the control unit so control unit measures and if it is uh, the fuel pressure is okay then the fuel pump the pump fuel which is actually a uh, high pressure fuel pump uh, if the pressure rate, pressure is high what actually happens is this fuel right if this is too high if this is too high more fuel will not be coming through this way this yellow color valve will open and the fuel comes through from the filter into the high pressure pump will be returning back to this fuel pressure control valve right and it will return back to the sorry back sorry back to the uh, fuel tank itself 
again. So again, I will explain. Assume that the fuel pressure is higher, right? Higher than the predetermined uh, value, right? So the fuel pressure sensors and the fuel pressure in the rail and uh, easy to understand, okay, this is high. So you don't need to increase the fuel pressure more than that. In such case, the fuel that comes from the fuel tank, which is uh, delivered to the tank, from the tank to the high pressure pump, will not be actually reaching the pressurizing pump. It will be returned back. It will be returned back through this line, through this pressure control valve over here. PCV valve is pressure control valve. It will be returned back to the fuel returning line and goes back to the fuel tank itself. Right? Fuel tank itself. Right? So, uh, the fuel, after it's actually pressurized, the fuel is actually delivered here, which is actuated based on this, all the sensors over here, all the sensors over here, uh, which includes the accelerator paddle, engine crank speed, uh, engine speed, engine crank, engine speed, uh, so crank and cam position sensories and uh, accelerator paddle and any other uh, sensors over here, so that means the lambda sensor as well. So this is how basically it operates and uh, the diesel engines actually operate the pressure of this injector pressure is around 40,000 PSI because it has to meet with the 25 to 1 compression ratio at least around 20, 17 to 25 to 1 compression ratio is there that's high very high pressure in order to uh, deliver for instantly atomized fuel at that pressure, the fuel also has to be increased in to a very high pressure. That's why this system is, this, uh, the manufacturer, the assembly of the system is somewhat different. The working procedure is very much similar if you only consider the petrol uh, fuel system. Uh, this is how basically the diesel fuel injection system works, but if we move to the gasoline direct fuel injection system or GDI system, you may see it almost the same as before. So only difference here is uh, in the um, petrol engine, it needs to have a throttle pedal. It needs to have a throttle pedal in order to control the air. Based on that air control only, engine can actually control the amount of fuel. But now it has been somewhat different instead of controlling the instead of controlling the throttle valve instead of measuring the throttle valve in the GDI engines throttle paddle position is directly measured by the ECU and ECU actually adjusts the throttle valve based on that so this actually adjusts the throttle valve I forgot to put the throttle valve here it should be throttle valve here. right so throttle valve should be included here so based on that throttle valve will be controlled, okay? So throttle valve control uh, controls how much of air goes in and that controls, that gives an idea for easy to understand how much of fuel should be actually injected. So other than that, only difference here is uh, this fuel injector does not have a heat back line. Oh, there's no sensor inside the fuel injector in the petrol fuel injection system or direct GDI engines. They don't have fuel uh, sensor going back to the ECU. Uh, and the other difference is these are actually operating in much lower pressure since these are running around 40, maximum around 14 to 1. Uh, compression ratios right maximum of 14 to 1 competition ratio but very rarely it goes up to there usually it's run around uh, for, uh, around uh, 12 11 something like that but the fuel injector fuel control fuel control this section this section is quite different in a GDI engine the main difference of a GDI engine is these engines can actually run at very lean fuel system Right, they are designed to run the engine at a linear uh, air fuel ratios, right? Sometimes up to around 25 to 1. 
So usually we uh, stoichiometric is 70 into uh, uh, 14.721, lambda is 14.721, but DDI system can run up to around 30 to 1, right? Can run up to 30 to 1 air fuel ratio, right? So that's why DDI engines are very efficient in uh, fuel controlling, but not all the time, not all the time, only at, only around cruising, only around cruising, these engines can actually run at these, uh, low uh, uh, these lean air fold ratios in uh, all the other times it's actually run similar to the other engines uh, so yeah so DDI engines the um, reduction so if you see the assembly wise you have a high pressure sensor or high pressure pump right high pressure fuel pump in this case high pressure fuel pump is actually made of our uh, fixed into the uh, camshaft itself so it, it's actually delivered high pressure fuel into the fuel rail itself. So this is the fuel rail here and it has a sensor which goes back to the ECU, right? In, uh, uh, but this one actually has a full relief valve. So if it is too much pressure, this will automatically open. And uh, the difference between the construction wise main difference is this injector directly inject the fuel into the injection combustion chamber. In a port fuel injection, fuel is actually injected somewhere over here, right, into this port oil. So by having this, it can actually atomize fuel better, it can mix fuel better, so it can deliver more fuel. So by adding a little bit less fuel, it can actually get better fuel combustion chamber. So these are running in very uh, optimal lean combustion modes and provide very good fuel consumption uh, values, especially in uh, low, um, especially in a low engine, sorry. This can actually run uh, lean, uh, very lean and uh, produce very good uh, fuel consumption values, especially during cruising. Right, especially during the increasing is just driving at normal speed. And in addition to this, where the compression air pole ratio variation is very high, if you need high power, it can actually come to around 8 to 1, uh, 12, 10 to 1, something like that, uh, to 25 to 30 to 1. Uh, air pole ratio variation can actually obtain from these engines. So that's why they are actually. Uh, feels powerful but also produce a very good uh, uh, fuel economy right but uh, again i need to actually explain one more thing we you should not actually uh, you should not actually uh, uh, actually how to say this so gdi if you have you might have heard like Montero GDIs and uh, Mini Pedro GDI Pedro or something like that uh, came around 2000, uh, 98, 2000, something like that. So that GDI system and the modern GDI system is somewhat different. The difference is only related to, mainly related to the engine uh, management system, not the construction. Construction wise, both are actually similar, but uh, operation wise, those engines can even run even leaner, right? They can run even lean so that means they will reach up to around 70 to 1 i heard i, I have never seen this but uh, according to what i have heard and what i have learned it can actually reach up to around 70 to 1 air fuel ratio uh, air fuel ratios which is uh, which is uh, difficult and that's why those engines are known to have known as failed engine. So anyway, so that's what uh, uh, the whole fuel system is. But once we combine all of these things into, uh, once we combine all of these components, we actually ended up having something like this. So you have your fuel uh, system and fuel comes into the, from fuel pump to fuel filter, into the high pressure fuel pump, which actually uh, pump fuel through the fuel rail, which measure the fuel temp, fuel sensor, fuel pressure, it will actually control the fuel, 
uh, it will actually control the fuel pressure. And uh, in addition to that, you have a oil temperature sensor. For should be fuel temperature sensor for measuring the fuel temperature in order to perfectly inject the fuel into the engine to operate at its optimum condition. So you have fuel and you have the fresher uh, return lines up to here and comes back to the fuel tank. Then uh, this fuel, fuel pressure sensor and fuel temperature sensor readings goes to the ECU to control these fuel injectors. So camshaft and uh, crankshaft positioning sensors. So there are two uh, sig two signals. So sensors are shown here because there are two camshaft in this case. So uh, that's why it's actually showing two. And uh, you have intake air temperature sensor and coolant temperature sensor intake air temperature. There are two intake air temperature sensors. Probably there are two air intake banks if it is like a V8 engine or something. Probably. Have to check with that. Uh, fuel temperature sensor again. Mm. Okay, there's a fuel temperature here, fuel oil temperature. Here. Anyway, so our next part is, uh, so we have, I actually wanted to discuss about this section. So now uh, whole modern fuel system is somewhat different over here. So you have the control module, you don't have throttle valve. So even your throttle paddle is actually directly connected to the electronic control module. So you don't have ECU anymore, you have ECMs and PCMs. I'll explain later, PCM is the power train control module, right? So throttle pedals and everything goes to the ECM. So everything, everything is actually connected to this ECU, which monitors everything and optimize everything and uh, actuate everything. So this is a mini computer uh, for the most part. So it measures and it uh, takes the decisions based on the situation from the readings it's actually have. Okay, so that's it. For today so i am supposed to give you assignment number three for this uh, uh, for this uh, particular unit so the twelve system unit twelve system unit uh, my assignment will be something like this the main purpose for this uh, assignment is for you guys to do it by yourself not to take someone else's one and copy it and send it to me so your assignment number three will be you're preparing a small video of yourself, right? Explaining the operation of electronic fuel system of a diesel and petrol engines, right? Whatever we discussed today, you can explain it very simply, right? Uh, you can use, uh, if you have your computers, you can use just your computers, but I need to see, I need proof that you are actually doing it. So not to copy from somewhere else, I need you guys to show yourself and do it by yourself. Uh, five to 10 minutes more than enough, as much as possibly, just explain the uh, fuel injection time uh, system. You can submit it through LMS and the deadline is 5th of August, 2021. Okay, so a very simple one, just explain the fuel system. So if you prefer to use a whiteboard or just a paper, draw and explain. That's also very accepted, very much appreciated and accepted. Any method is accepted. Uh, whatever you have, you can just use it. If you have a computer, just use the computer. If you have a phone only, just use the computer. Phone is enough. Phone is more than enough for me. Uh, just uh, you explaining it properly and uh, showing clearly what happens and with your face. I need you to see the faces guys copying a lot uh i if more than yeah so you have two weeks uh so two weeks mean again so if you submit it after 12 and send me a message uh, saying that my power went off my uncle had this my bar uh, i don't know my okay something happened don't i don't care i'm not accepting 
if you you i think you had a uh, assignment yesterday if you send anything after 12 none of them will be accepted even after yesterday no exception because yesterday uh delum uh, your representative called me around 12 uh no 10 o'clock but 10 o'clock 10 10 or something like that. so after that you had two hours for submission if you have actually did it you might have submitted before that you could have submitted before that so because of that reason no uh no i can't so i think i am the only person giving like two weeks so because of that and uh, uh and uh, since you have enough time to do these things no excuses only by that particular time i won't accept anything afterwards uh yes so that's it uh thank you very much if you have any questions you can ask now or you could have asked earlier also no one asked me so 